tourists love swimming the crystal clear blue waters of paradise. But how clean is the water? In most tourist areas, the water that used to be bright blue and clear is now dark green and turbid and most of the corals have died. We can see why here in Cozumel, where the few remaining corals, sea fans, and sea whips are being overgrown and killed by slimy mats of bacteria and algae while tourists swim above. I'm Tom Garreau, president of the Global Coral Reef Alliance. When I was a little boy in Jamaica, I would watch my father diving 300 feet below. The divers in Cozumel asked me to tell them why their reefs were being killed by algae, because I've been diving on reefs all around the Caribbean, Indian Ocean, and Pacific for 50 years. When I tracked the worst bacteria and algae in Cozumel, they led straight to the captive dolphin pens. This is the outer chain link of Chankanab Dolphin Park. It is covered with huge slimy masses of cyanobacteria. The same species is smothering reefs of southeast Florida for miles around all sewage outfalls. It is an indicator of severe pollution. In Cozumel, corals a kilometer away are being killed, and the closer to the pens, the worse it is. I have never seen them as bad as this anywhere except at the end of sewer pipes. I swam for miles along the coast, and it was clear that the source was the dolphin pens. Bacteria and algae were all over reefs downstream of the dolphin pens, but were almost completely absent on the upstream side. These algae grow fastest when dissolved nitrogen and phosphorus nutrients are high. I was very surprised to find that the dolphin pens were the major source of nutrients and algae along western Cozumel. That's because most sewage is pumped to the north, and Cozumel strictly protects groundwater quality to safeguard drinking water. The slimy reddish-brown bacteria mats are broken up by storms, polluting reefs downstream. The dolphin pens send divers to scrub them off the fence, but they grow back in days because they are fertilized by nutrients from rotting dolphin food and excrement. At this facility, a quarter of a million tourists a year, paying up to $150, swim with dolphins in their wastes. Do they know what they're swimming in? Do they swallow water? The tourists probably won't have to go to the bathroom while they are here. But the dolphins have no choice. Where does it go when a dolphin's got to go? One dolphin excretes as much as four to six people, so the 10 to 15 dolphins in this pen are equivalent to 40 to 90 people fed more food than they can eat, with all food and excrement falling into the water. Wild dolphins swim hundreds of kilometers a day, so their pollution is diluted over a huge area and does not affect the reef. When they are penned up, you can see the water cloudy with bacteria growing on specks of rotting excrement and food. That's why the water is green and turbid instead of clear and blue. At another captive dolphin pen at Isla Mujeres, the water is much more polluted than Cozumel because it is downstream from Cancun, where most sewage is discharged with little or no treatment. But again, the algae are completely different on the upstream and downstream sides of the dolphin pens. The downstream side is algae indicating extreme pollution that are not found on the upstream side. The algae that forms huge masses like green cotton candy is another extreme high nutrient indicator. This species was the worst coral killer along the north coast of Jamaica when sewage discharges from uncontrolled development polluted the waters. It grows so fast that big clumps of algae litter the sand, which should be clean and white. Another sign of severe pollution is the dark green color of the water from microscopic plants fertilized by excessive nutrients. Here we are in front of the turtle farm on Grand Cayman. The white particles are bacteria growing on rotting turtle excrement. There are dense mats of weeds all over the shallow rocks, which should be clean white or pink if nutrients were low. These algae are normally found in high nutrient areas of mangroves, especially where garbage and sewage is dumped. The bottom in front of the discharge is covered with sludge, so algae grow mainly on shallow rocks where waves wash the sludge off. There are few corals left near the discharge. They have many dead portions overgrown by bacteria and algae. One can try to save the corals by brushing off the slime, but it will grow right back as long as the nutrients remain high. These corals are doomed. Deeper down, the bottom is covered with dead corals overgrown by thick lawns of algae. This is a nearly dead reef with only a few live corals left, but this was all once a healthy coral reef. 
Almost all of the surviving corals are dying from diseases. The bright white areas are exposed limestone skeletons of corals that have just died very recently. After only a few days, they turn green, red, or brown as different kinds of algae overgrow them. The brown patches are still living coral tissue, but they won't live long because this disease kills corals many centimeters a day, hundreds of times faster than the corals can grow. Humans don't get sick until pollution is much worse than the levels that sicken and kill corals. If it were the other way around, swimming and diving would be banned in these areas. These film clips are unusual local pollution problems caused by nutrients from captive dolphins and turtles, but be glad I haven't filmed the effects of human wastes. Nutrients from human sewage, garbage, and fertilizers from golf courses and agriculture are millions of times more abundant, killing reefs in all developed coastal areas. Worldwide, most sewage is not treated, and secondary sewage treatment, the highest level found in most tourist areas, does not remove the nutrients. But the wastewaters are great fertilizer for plants, which recycle nutrients on land and prevent coastal pollution. Coral reefs are the most sensitive ecosystems, and they are killed when nutrients are so low they would not affect any other aquatic habitat. Coral reefs are sick of human wastes. Coral reef protection requires the highest possible water quality standards. Our current standards are irrelevant because they are based on human health, and we can drink waters with nutrients hundreds of times higher than those that kill corals. That's why almost every tropical tourist area is surrounded by dead and dying coral reefs and why people are starting to get sick from ear and skin infections. At the United Nations expert meeting on waste management in small island developing states, I was asked to speak on how to prevent the effects of nutrient pollution on coral reefs and fisheries. After I spoke, the participants called for all land-based sources of nutrients near reefs to be recycled on land. Why smother reefs by over-fertilizing them when the land is so deficient in nutrients that we have to keep buying fertilizer to keep lawns, golf courses, gardens, and farms green? We are killing the ocean and starving the land at the same time, but we can solve both problems at once by recycling nutrients where they are most needed. The only way to get rid of algae-killing reefs is to starve them of nutrients. Then they die back very quickly and the reef can gradually recover. Sustainable tourism means maintaining a healthy environment by keeping all our wastes out of the water. A healthy reef full of corals and fish in clear water is the best proof that we are effective. Until we clean up the water, tourists will see only sick and dying reefs. We can bring them back only if we are responsible. This footage is from Komodo in Indonesia and it shows a transition from a low nutrient environment that's coral dominated to a high nutrient environment where the algae have smothered and killed everything. This is what we're trying to prevent happening to our reefs. This has been a film by the Global Coral Reef Alliance, a international non-profit group of volunteers working to save, protect, and restore coral reefs all around the world.